All right, good evening. All right, welcome to everyone. We're so glad that you were able to join us here today. My name is Ami Bhatt, and this is Franklin Huang. We are the co-founders and co-directors of the Global Oncology Initiative at Harvard. Um, we'd like to welcome all of you to our MGH Go Talk. In particular, um, we're very lucky to have a representative of the Embassy of the Republic of Botswana here, who has flown in all the way from DC. Uh, this is Masta, or Master Vipedi, um, who has joined us. We're very, very delighted to have you here. Um, just by way of introduction, Go, the Global Oncology Initiative at Harvard, started approximately a year or so ago. Um, when Franklin and I joined together to try to unite all of the academic um, communities within the Harvard system, both the medical school, the public health school, and the various academic medical facilities to work together on the issues surrounding global oncology. Um, over the course of the past year, we've been lucky to have a steering committee that has helped to guide us along this process um, from an academic perspective. In addition to this, we've had a groundswell of interest from the community and have built into community-based efforts as well. Um, we've branched out into innovative technological solutions to try to improve cancer care and research, both domestically and abroad. Um, many, many thanks go out to members of the GO community who have participated in pulling this talk together today. Um, in particular, I wanted to thank Rebecca Clayman, who represents MGH, Ali Chisti, and Teo Kolarova, who are the two student organizers of the event, as well as Bruce Chabner, Jason Estathew, Jason Harlow, and others from the MGH community who have helped to support the event. Addie Donnelly, Anna Norcross, and Lydia Shapira form our Go Talks core group um, and have helped to build this program as well. So the, the Go Talks started back in November. Uh, we kicked it off um, at uh, Dana Farber Brigham um, with, with Dr. Paul Farmer. And the Go Talks were really organized to rotate throughout the Harvard affiliated hospitals and institutions as a way to catalyze both the community and build the community in global oncology, as well as take a new steps forward by bringing this to get, uh, community together. So today we hope that that is one step forward, um, especially as we discuss and talk about Botswana and cancer care in Botswana. And um, all of the talks we should mention are um, recorded and live uh, uh, and available for webcast on our website, globalonc.org. So today we have a full program. We have uh, our keynote speaker, Julie Livingston, followed by um, our panel discussion moderated by Dan Longo, and we will have introductions um, uh, this, uh, this evening by uh, Dr. David Bangsberg and Dr. Bruce Chabner. So um, Dr. David Bangsberg is the director of the MJ Center for Global Health. For, for Global Health, He's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he's also an associate member of the Reagan Institute of MGH. Um, he's a visiting professor at Embraer University of Science and Technology in Uganda, and he received his medical degree from Johns Hopkins and holds a Master of Science from King's College at the University of London and a Master of Public Health from the University of California, Berkeley. We're very pleased that he could be here today with us. Thanks. Thank you, Franklin. It's a pleasure to have this wonderful event at Mass General. My deepest thanks to the Global Oncology Network uh, for uh, organizing this event and allowing us to um, participate. I'd also like to thank Bruce Chabner, Jay Lawfer, and Dan Haber for supporting Global Health and their departments here at Mass General. Uh, there is growing, growing enthusiasm for Global Health work at Mass General and the uh, mission of the Center of Glo for Global Health at Mass General is really to leverage Mass General's 200 year history of clinical care, education, and innovation to improve the health of our global neighborhood, our global neighbors. This mission is, stems from the core founding of the hospital when in distress, every man is our neighbor. And with the talent at Mass General, we're truly reaching out to a global neighborhood. And this initiative of technology transfer to Botswana, I think, is one of our the best examples of such a partnership. This adds to decade-long partnerships <laughs> focusing on HIV immunology in South Africa, social and behavioral aspects of HIV and poverty in Uganda, palliative care, in Vietnam, 
maternal child health in India and diarrheal disease in Bangladesh. My calendar is filled with students who are knocking on the door saying, I want to get involved in global health. I think there's a new wave of idealism in young people with a new sense of interconnectedness. And the students are striving and, and thriving to and looking for leadership and mentors in global health and to have programs like this to provide that mentorship, to provide that infrastructure, truly creates the educational experience for young people that we all strive to achieve. And with all this activity, you might be surprised to know that uh, when Paul Farmer helped us open up the MGH Center for Global Health, he said that MGH truly stands for Mecca in Global Health. And we're pleased to uh, 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 build on uh, Paul's success. So it's now a pleasure for me to introduce um, Dr. Bruce Chabner. Bruce has devoted his career to research and drug development. He's the Director of Clinical Research at the MGH Cancer Center and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. After Yale, Bruce received his MD from Harvard and trained in medicine at the Peter Brent Brigham Hospital and in medical oncology at the National Cancer Institute. Prior to coming to MGH as Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology, Bruce directed the Drug Development Program and Clinical Trials effort at the NCI's Division of Cancer Treatment. And for the last few years, Bruce has also chaired the National Cancer Center Advisory Board. Dr. Chapman. Thank you, David. I really had a very small part in, in orga organizing this. Uh, I, there's so many people to thank, uh, particularly Jason. I don't know if, if you've been thanked yet adequately, but uh, he, he's been the uh, guiding force here in terms of the relationship to Botswana and uh, actually introduced me to this effort. Uh, you've heard from, from uh, Ami and Franklin, who really initiated the program. There are a couple of medical students uh, that are, have been key. Teodora and Al Ali, who is here, my golfer friend, and uh, um, many other people that, that have really helped out. And it's particularly a pleasure now to introduce Julie Livingston, who is our, our speaker. Julie uh, has had firsthand experience with cancer in Africa, has written a very interesting book about, her, about that experience called Improvising Medicine. And um, I think that she has much more to tell us about uh, cancer as a disease and as a, as a social issue uh, <coughs> in Botswana. Um, Julie is an associate professor in the Department of History with a major interest in anthropology. Uh, at Rutgers University, and uh, it's really a pleasure. Where's, where is Julie? I can't find her. There you are. Okay. Good, good to have you, Julie. And uh, I would also note that Julie's dad and I were interns together at the, the Brigham, so we go back a number of years. Julie, we're, we're, we can't wait to hear about your, your experience. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. It is really nice to be here. It's always good to be in Boston, which is my hometown, even though the mayor, the beloved mayor, is resigning, even as I speak, um, or not seeking re-election. <clears throat> and I'm very grateful, as is everyone here, to Ami and Franklin, as well as Lydia Shapira, Ali and Teodora, and of course, uh, Bruce Chabner for inviting me to come. I am not a scientist or a clinician, I'm an ethnographer, a humanist. And ethnography is a mode of writing as much as it is a mode of research. So I'm going to do something very unscientific and read to you rather than give you a talk based on slides, which is probably what you're more accustomed to. My task, as I see it, is to comprehend and describe a situation in human terms so that people like you can better identify areas for productive research and intervention. Then together, I think we'll need to consider the politics, the politics of knowledge and the politics of resources uh, that shape the situation and any attempts to address it. 
I'm invoking the term politics here in the most expansive um, sense possible because I think the danger here um, is that if we fail to fully recognize the humanity of the patients who lie at the center of this enterprise, uh, we can't reduce them to their disease, we can't reduce them to their economic status, to their cultural milieu, nor to a spectacle of suffering. All of those things matter, but what really matters is that they're patients, they're human beings, just like you and me. The situation I want to describe is the cancer epidemic that is emerging rapidly in southern Africa. We are at the beginning of something here, and it's going to be a game changer. This cancer epidemic is going to profoundly shape the future of global health. It raises fundamental policy, technological, scientific, and caregiving challenges for southern Africans and for the um, international community, including oncology alike. This is why we're all here. This is why Ami and Franklin are to be commended for starting a conversation around these urgent issues. In Southern Africa, cancer, I argue, is the critical face of health after antiretrovirals. But as such, it behooves us to take as open a view of the situation as possible even as people begin to act. Unfortunately, we already know from our own country, this is not an epidemic that's going to be solved by a magic bullet or by a bunch of smart people sitting around a table together. It's a multidimensional, long-term pro uh, problem, and clinical oncology asks a tremendous amount from very sick people. Clinical oncology is a dangerous and at times iatrogenic so absolutely vital pursuit. So your work needs to be energetic, but self-critical at every single juncture. My window into this epidemic is a 20-bed cancer ward and its associated clinic at Princess Marina Hospital, what I call PMH for short. This is Botswana Central Referral Hospital, where between 2006 and 2009, I worked on and off as an ethnographer. Some of you I know have been there more recently than the last time I was there, and no doubt things have changed since I left. This is a moving target. Um, so others may have different perspectives to add, and hopefully that will come out in our panel discussion later. I want to offer you the tiniest bit of background in order to get you situated. Botswana is a middle-income country in Southern Africa. It is not a low-income country like its neighbor Zimbabwe, to which I will also be referring, because the contrast between the two of them is important for understanding the scope and the complexity of the epidemic across the region. <clears throat> Botswana has a population of only about 2 million people. It's about the size of France. But at the time I was doing my research, it also, or informal estimates, put the population of um, political and economic migrants from Zimbabwe within the country at also at 2 million. So you can imagine the problem that the Botswana government faces when they have parity between a population of undocumented migrants who've come in seeking succor and economic and political relief, and at the same time, they have their own uh, development trajectory to manage. Botswana was systematically and deeply impoverished by British colonialism and in many ways run as a labor reserve for white South African mining industry in what was then an institutionally racist state, by which I'm referring to apartheid South Africa. But after independence in 1966, Botswana, as citizens of Botswana are called, discovered a vast diamond wealth in their country. They have managed and developed that wealth via a stable democracy steadily investing their diamond revenue in infrastructure and social services, including universal health care for their citizens. This is the first thing to take note of here. We have a middle-income country committed to a system of universal care that they have built from the ground up. And I know Paul was here in the fall, so you've also heard about Rwanda's system of universal care as it's currently being built from the ground up. So we Americans, including myself, here in our high-income country, where we have been systematically dismantling our public institutions, might bear this in mind. 
As we look to partner with places like Botswana, we should do so with some very thoughtful respect in the face of their ability to accomplish things that we cannot. If we look to Botswana only as a site of suffering or of radical difference and rush in to quote unquote help, a century of historical experience from across the globe shows that when offered in that kind of mode, our help will be less efficacious. And as Americans, we have the opportunity to learn something from Botswana, something that could be tremendously valuable to us back here at home. Beginning in the mid-1990s, Botswana was at the epicenter of the HIV AIDS epidemic in Southern Africa. I lived in Botswana during the worst years of 96 to 99, and the loss of life and widespread experiences of illness were truly stunning. In response to this, again, this very forward-thinking, effective government partnered with the Gates Foundation and Merck Pharmaceutical to establish the first public ARV, or antiretroviral, program on the continent, which began scaling up in 2002. This is not an archipelago of little NGO-run programs that patients have to run between, hoping that they can find a spot in, hoping that that program won't fold in the next year while they run to find a spot somewhere else, as you see in other areas in Eastern and Southern Africa. This is a public, nationally-run program the first one on the continent. It is enormously important. The data from 2010 showed uh, nearly just under a quarter of adults in the country carrying the virus. So obviously, ARVs are absolutely critical. But unfortunately, human suffering is a cat and mouse game. And the distribution of antiretrovirals has helped to foster a cancer epidemic. Again, those antiretrovirals need to be there, but that's not the end of the story. Then the next problem necessarily occurs. We, we know this is how epidemiological trajectories unfold. Meanwhile, HIV has also helped to make the extant burden of cancers visible to public health. Let me see if I can briefly explain what I mean by this ethnographically. On the 20th of May, 2009, Lovemore Moyo, not his real name, using a pseudonym, lay in the medical ward of PMH, short of breath and racked with pain and panic. Mr. Moyo had Kaposi sarcoma in his lungs. He needed chemotherapy urgently, but though his friends and family were stretching all of their resources to raise the necessary funds, they were coming up short and now he was nearing the end of his third week in the medical ward still awaiting treatment. As I've said, medical care, including oncology, is provided as a public good for Botswana citizens under a program of universal care. But as a Zimbabwean national, Mr. Moyo had to pay. And again, it's worth pausing for a moment and contemplating this. Only two decades earlier, Zimbabwe had some of the best medical care on the African continent and an innovative policy of social medicine. But by 2007, Zimbabweans were streaming across the border into PMH saying there is nothing in the hospital there, not even a Panadol, you know, which is like a Tylenol. Nothing. These are an empty box now. So there's a cautionary tale here. Development is not always a one-way road that proceeds in a stepwise fashion. It can undergo stunning reversals. So if you commit to a place, you want to be in it for the long haul. When I arrived in the crowded medical ward with the PMH oncologist, Dr. P, who was meeting this patient for the first time, Mr. Moyo engaged us, and he was very active in explaining his situation. A private, newly diagnosed cancer patient in a public hospital, a Zimbabwean immigrant living in a highly xenophobic time. This was the summer when there was the spectacular violence against Zimbabwean immigrants across the border in South Africa. Not in Botswana, but in South Africa where uh, several people were murdered. So this is a precarious situation that he was in. He was quite desperate. Dr. P looked at me and in a flat tone said, we will pay for him if need be, but he will get his chemo this afternoon. So at lunchtime, I headed to the cash machine to get my portion of the money that Mr. Moyo would need, which wasn't very much, no more than the cost of going out for an evening in New York City where I live, and I'm a cheap date. I mean like pizza and a movie, not, you know. 
<clears throat> so we fawned over to the medical ward to send him for his chemo. An orderly wheeled him to oncology, where he immediately died. The problem is, the countless African cancer patients like Love More Moyo have never quite fit into our broader understandings of African health and therefore the structure and logic of health policy on the continent. This includes both policy related to prevention as well as to treatment. When Lawrence Summers in 1991, as then Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank, promoted the dumping of to toxic waste in Africa since, in his words, Africans didn't live long enough to care about cancer. He couldn't imagine Love More Moyo, who at 33 could hardly be considered old. I'm 46, so 33 is very young. Um, nor could he imagine the fulminating mass on Mary Setabello's breast, the blasts packing Boniface Modipani's bone marrow, or the tumor that was strangling Radicomo Molefi's throat shut. Nor could he envision the seemingly endless queue of patients and relentless pressures on bed space in this tiny oncology ward where Lovemore died. I am sure I do not need to point to the irony to you all of the chief economist of the major engine of economic policy in the Global South, the World Bank, promoting carcinogenic relationships as holding the path to African development. And yet, in this respect, Summers was far from alone. This is not to vilify him as a unique individual, but to just say this was a plausible thought for him to have at that time. Until quite recently, for the most part, global health experts ignored cancer, and the oncology community ignored Africa. This will have to change. This is why I am so encouraged to be here in such a full room. Lovemore had made his way to one small node in an all too sparse network of care for the millions of cancer patients across the global south. The ward was already overcrowded when he arrived with two extra beds already crammed into the female side, thus taking up all floor space. This cancer ward sits at the end of a corridor that's lined with long, narrow wooden benches. Their patients and their relatives sit waiting for their turn in the clinic. Some of them have risen long before dawn to take a taxi or bus or ambulance ride from hundreds of kilometers away. Others come from within the city itself. Many will wait for five or six hours or more for their turn in the clinic office with the hospital's lone oncologist, who in addition to an average of 25 to 30, but on the worst days as many as 40 outpatient visits in the day, also manages a 20-bed ward performs his own cytology, administers the chemotherapy, and of course deals with a significant amount of paperwork. Only a decade ago, in 2002, the year that Botswana's lone oncology ward swung into action, there were an ex estimated 650,000 new cancer cases on the African continent alone. And epidemiologists estimate that figure will double over the next decade. Men and women, not surprisingly, suffer from slightly different cancers. For men, uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, or KS, was the most common cancer in 2002, followed by cancer of the liver, prostate, bladder, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and esophagus. For women, cervical cancer takes the lead, accounting for nearly a quarter of all female cancers, followed closely by breast cancer, responsible for nearly a fifth. After that comes KS, liver, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and ovarian cancer in descending order. Indeed, virus-associated cancers, like Love More Moyos, are emerging as a profound problem across East and Southern Africa. This secondary epidemic tracks through populations that are now gaining access to antiretroviral drugs. Patients who previously would have died of AIDS-related infections are now living long enough to endure opportunistic cancers facilitated by their history of immunosuppression. A minority, but unfortunately given the, the um, scale of the AIDS epidemic, a significant number of human beings, of HIV patients will contract a virus-associated cancer before being initiated on ARVs or during the process of partial immune reconstitution. This shouldn't be surprising, right? Experience here in this country has already uh, shown us that cancer and HIV enjoy a troubling synergy. 
This dynamic is underscored by the fact that three virus-associated cancers, KS, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and cervical cancer, served as AIDS indicator illnesses, right? So we know that these things are married together. In 2003, program officials at the National Cancer Institute predicted what Botswana had already recognized, that this new uh, African epidemic was coming. And African oncologists and health planners, as well as other members of the international oncology community, have been warning of rising incidence rates for some time. I would also add that HIV appears to complicate prognoses for non-virus associated cancers, lung cancer, breast cancer, esophageal cancer, in ways we do not yet fully understand. Meanwhile, the epidemiological and institutional attention that's garnered by the presence of these new um, cancer patients that are entangled with the AIDS industry that has come to Southern Africa is beginning to unearth, to reveal a much broader and longer standing problem of cancer on the continent. That epidemic is facilitated by shifting ecological, political, and demographic conditions. In fact, in 1997, only a decade prior to the day I met Mr. Moyo, for the first time in my life, I saw untreated advanced cancer. In other words, cancer without oncology. It was a horrible epiphany. I was in Botswana visiting patients with a home-based care team from a village clinic when we encountered a massive florid growth that was killing a boy who slowly, silently writhed in agony as his mother and aunt stood by. His leg was swollen to really impossible proportions from an osteogenic sarcoma. It was a really stunning spectacle, and we had come to bring a small plastic bag of ibuprofen, which was clearly inadequate to the task. I would soon see many more such scenes, and in the process come to understand that while cancer with oncology is awful, as unfortunately I'm sure many people in the room already know firsthand, cancer without oncology is obscene. So this small cancer ward in Botswana is a very promising development. And yet, at present, it is an improvised solution in a broader context of widespread need. We face a situation in which the oncological cutting edge keeps edging up cost and therapeutic intensity, while patients in impoverished contexts are often ignored wholesale for lack of funds. In middle-income countries, like Botswana, patients receive care from clinicians who are buckling under the weight of growing caseloads, while at the same time they're struggling to adapt the type of knowledge, technologies, and goods that are developed here in Boston or in New York, or in Paris, to their own local biological, technological, institutional, and economic circumstances. This is no simple task. Most cancer patients in Africa have a hard time accessing care. You already know this. Experts estimate that only 20% of African patients have any potential access to radiotherapy. And access is not the same thing as quality treatment, since many machines are ill-maintained or they're run at higher doses for shorter courses in order to handle the volume of patients, or the patient doesn't have money. They're in a privatized system, unlike in Botswana. They have to pay out of pocket, and they can only afford three days in the machine rather than the 10 that they require or what have you. But even if care is available, <coughs> as it is in Botswana, cancer in Khabarone differs from cancer in Boston. The biological, the epidemiological, the technological contexts of Southern Africa are beyond the conception, much less the evidentiary base of most oncology research, which emphasizes ever newer drugs and techniques. <clears throat> Fewer studies address the chemotherapeutic challenges of patients like Lovemore Moyo, who have simultaneous HIV and tubercular co-infections alongside their cancer. Personalized medicine is not what he needs. <laughs> he needs a different kind of knowledge. Newer, smart drugs like Herceptin are too expensive to consider, and important support interventions like Neupogen for treating the neutropenia that's a side effect um, of chemotherapy are too costly to use. 
Nursing conditions are also different, such that often the necessary support care to enable, for example, concurrent radiotherapy and chemo, which is the standard of care for many cancers, is simply not possible. You can't put in a port. You can't put in a feeding tube. Isolation conditions aren't possible. You have cancer patients sometimes lying next to people who have meningitis. Um, so this is a difficult situation. Powerful antiemetics are by and large not available, such that Love More Moyo died surrounded by the sound of patients bent over their vomitus, retching their guts out. And an international network of laws designed to prevent the illicit trade in narcotics also prevents most terminally ill African patients from accessing vitally necessary opioid analgesics. I know Eric Krakauer has already been here to talk about pain and palliation, and I can really think of no better human being for you um, to hear about that from. I just want to strongly underscore the importance of palliation as an ethos. Of course, nothing palliates like cure. But if the cure makes you vomit so hard that you can't function for days on end, you might not be able to carry through the treatment to the point of cure, even when cure is possible. And of course, nausea of that kind is a living hell. So it is morally unacceptable to expect patients to put up with it when there are drugs available to ameliorate it. In most countries, thankfully not Botswana, patients must purchase their drugs themselves, and so they often cannot afford the entire regimen. I've uh, seen in context a patient return from the private pharmacy. They go, they see the oncologist, they're sent out into the marketplace to buy their drugs, to buy whatever equipment they need, sutures, a pocket of blood, you name it. Then they come back into the hospital, and maybe they've bought either doxorubicin or cisplatin, but they can't afford the full course. This obviously is not the way we want oncology to work. Even in Botswana or Rwanda, the two places where patients are receiving oncology, including drugs and radiation, as a right of citizenship, there are problems of supply. Evidence-based oncology protocols published in the leading medical journals don't tell you what to do when a topicide, 5-FU, bleomycin, or cisplatin suddenly go out of stock, as each of them did uh, for lengthy periods of time while I was working in PMH. Even when the off-patent drugs in Botswana's stripped-down arsenal are in stock, their oncologist needs to figure out how to be effective in a hospital that does not yet have an MRI machine, endoscopy, mammography, where tumor markers are unavailable, where often there are not enough platelets for all the patients who are bleeding. Needless to say, being effective in such a setting is a challenge, and it requires a high degree of intellectual and institutional creativity and energy. In 2010, I sat with an oncologist at a large public hospital in Zimbabwe as she combed through medical journals from the 1960s and early 1970s, which sat next to the latest issues of Lancet Oncology and Journal of the National Cancer Institute on her shelf as she was trying to determine the best course of treatment for her patient who was waiting outside on the bench. In other words, we have oncologists in these settings who have to keep as up-to-date as possible with the knowledge that's produced in places like the Dana-Farber, while also dipping back into an older store of knowledge and technique in order to be effective for their patients, because they work in a setting where the technological field is unstable and continually shifting. They don't know what's going to be available on any given day, so they constantly need to think diagonally and triangulate their knowledge. But despite their creativity, given such circumstances, it is not surprising at all that a recent study by the International Association for the Research on Cancer noted that the lifetime risk of dying from a cancer is nearly twice as high for an African woman as for a woman in a developed country. The case of cervical cancer back in Lovemore Moyo's hometown of Harare is instructive in this regard. In 2004, women there stood only a 30.5% chance of surviving five years after diagnosis, compared with 73% chance for an American woman. Now, it would be a serious mistake to imagine that virus-associated cancers are the only or even the main problem in Africa. Epidemiologists writing in The Lancet in 2008 estimated, this is a quote, as many as 36% of cancers in Africa are infection-related, exactly double the world average, end quote. This, of course, would leave 64%, nearly two-thirds, which are not. 
But nonetheless, let me pause for a moment with cervical cancer to help us think together about how the kind of metropolitan science that you all produce and the problems I see in my work in southern Africa might relate to one another, especially since it seems lately that cervical cancer is the thin end of the wedge. It's the cancer that garners the most attention to the problems that oncologists and their patients face in the region. Back in PMH, just across the ward from where Love More Moyo's corpse once sat, a row of women with cervical cancer lie in their beds awaiting a van that will take them across town. There they're going to queue for their turn with the country's only radiotherapy service, a linear accelerator owned by the Khabarone Private Hospital, which serves um, public patients on the government's dime. So it's a public-private partnership that's internal to the country. Um, although I do understand that new brachytherapy um, facilities have been established since I left, which is really wonderful because it used to be that then those women had to cross the border into South Africa to get internal radiation before being sent home. So that's a wonderful development. Some of these women are actively bleeding. Many have serious pain. All are understandably worried about their futures and those of their children. These are women who were diagnosed at one of the country's two colposcopy clinics, uh, after which they're booked a few months hence to complete diagnosis and begin treatment. Because of the capacity for laboratory testing and treatment are inadequate to the volume of patients, these patients have already waited for several months for the results of their pap smears and then another several months for booking at colposcopy. Nearly all of them who are eventually diagnosed with cancer are too far along for a simple hysterectomy and many of them have HIV further complicating their treatment options and further lowering their chances at cure. So the new see and treat programs, you know where they do visual inspection with acetic acid and then cryotherapy, like the one that's currently being pioneered by Dr. Doreen Ramachula Masire in her women's health clinic in PMH, which is part of the Botswana UPenn um, partnership, are a very welcome development. She's the in-country director of the, that partnership. So too is the potential promise of a vaccine. But preliminary research points to potential problems in Southern African reliance on Gardasil and Cervarix, the three-part high-cost vaccines for HPV, which were developed with American consumers in mind. So I give this to you as an example. Gardasil and Cervarix address the um, two oncogenic viral subtypes, type 16 and type 18, that are associated with the vast burden of cervical cancer and dysplasia in this country. Yet in some parts of Africa, the epidemiology of oncogenic viral subtypes for HPV differs from the U.S. context. Recent evidence, this is very preliminary stuff, larger systematic studies are ongoing. But preliminary evidence from urban Zambia, for example, which is just on Botswana's northern border, found that oncogenic HPV strains 52, 58, and 53 were far more prevalent than 16 or 18 in women with high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions or squamous cell carcinoma. By contrast, way up in um, West Africa in the Gambia, 16 and 18 were the most prevalent. Africa is a big country and it's epidemiologically diverse. Even were a vaccine targeting 16 and 18 is biologically appropriate, questions remain as to whether the suppression of prevalent oncogenic viral subtypes through vaccination might provide an opportunity for selective pressure by other currently less prevalent oncogenic viral subtypes within a given population. We don't know. If you clear 16 and 18 out, maybe 53 and 58 are suddenly going to come in like gangbusters. These are things we don't know. My point here is not to knock Gardasil and Cervarix. It's certainly not to interpret the science for you. I am an anthropologist. You all are doctors. Um, uh, but maybe, hopefully, these vaccines will turn out to be quite useful. What I'm trying to do, though, is point to the irony of a vaccine that's designed and marketed for the U.S., where we have very little cervical cancer, while in Africa there's an enormous burden, and yet the vaccine is not the best match biologically, not even to mention in terms of prices, 300 bucks, three shots. So it seems there's work to be done. Pharmaceuticals, equipment, expertise, and infrastructure are all needed. So, too, is knowledge that is developed specifically for these patients and their particular epidemiological and institutional circumstances. This is research that will require partnering with African oncologists, few though they are, 
who know these issues best. Equally necessary is a revision of the social contract in places outside of Botswana to provide broad-based social medicine. It makes absolutely no sense epidemiologically or in economic terms that the poorest people, like Lovemore Moyo's relatives back in Harare, are those who have to pay. We are never <laughs> going to treat cancer that way. Poor people cannot afford it. But also, it is ethically dangerous to do clinical research in settings where people's only access to medical care is gained by offering themselves up as experimental subjects. So the clinical trial cannot be the substitute for a system of social medicine. Nor can cancer be ignored with the argument some ethicists have made to me that oncology is simply too expensive for Africa. This is unacceptable because thanks to the hard work of people like many in this room, many cancers can be cured, lives can be extended, people can be palliated. And because, as perhaps you already know better than me, and this is why you are in oncology, untreated cancer is an obscenity. So if I might be so bold as to outline a few issues for us to consider as we contemplate the way forward. Number one, epidemiology. This is a complex but incredibly necessary business. Right now, cancer epidemiology in Africa is based on precious few registries and then extended through modeling and amplification, amplification to other sites. But remember, only an estimated 13% of deaths on the continent are registered. And gross population figures in many countries are politicized and unreliable. Just to give you a sense of what you're facing, the denominator is a big question mark. And now you're trying to count the numerator. And as we've all seen with the past history of HIV epidemiology, how totally often, in some cases, frankly, cooked the numbers have been at different times. And of course, cancer epidemiology is going to require pathology and screening, and in some cases, like I've just described with HPV, genotyping. So that brings me to thing two, which is needed, laboratory capacity. Building sustainable laboratory capacity in terms of technology, infrastructure, and expertise will be critical. It is absolutely wonderful that you're already extending the laboratory capacity that you have here through the internet to share it um, with partners in health in Rwanda, for example. But this can only be a stopgap measure as you help advocate for the establishment and maintenance of effective labs in C2. If you want to think more about this, I highly recommend you read a book by Iruka Okeke, who's a Nigerian microbiologist at Haverford. She's extremely thoughtful on these issues. Her book is called Divining Without Seeds. Uh, and then laboratories, of course, have to be conjoined to clinical practice. In order to have pathology, you need to have biopsies. Biopsies, of course, require time in minor theater. They require a scrub nurse. They require all sorts of things in terms of human and technical resources. Number three, screening. Mammography, see and treat. I could go on, but my point, my larger point is you can't screen if you don't have treatment. You cannot screen people and say, oh, looks like you've got a cancer, good luck. No, 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 no. If you want to screen people, you have to have somewhere to send them where you are going to help them. So these things need to be coordinated with one another. Number four, or maybe I'm on five, I've lost count. Prevention. Screening is not prevention. Of course, scaling up antiretroviral programs so that patients who are, in, are initiated on heart earlier, before their CD4 count plummets, will be helpful, but also, Remember that most cancers in Africa, two-thirds of them, are not sequelae of HIV. Remember that toxic waste dumping program. Remember that a significant portion of the world's uranium is mined in Africa, including in southern Africa. Remember that those gold mines across the border in South Africa are uranium-rich and radon daughters emanate from the rock, as Gabrielle Hecht has documented. Remember that on the northern border of South Africa, just over the border from uh, the southern side of Botswana, 
South Africans live in communities devastated by a history of asbestos mining. Children are playing on mine dumps. Asbestos tailing and sludge are in the groundwater. Remember that during Zimbabwe's War for Independence, the white Rhodesian state used what I am told are by Clapperton Mavungu, who's a science studies scholar at MIT, carcinogenic pesticides used in an attempt to exterminate insurgents, and these toxins linger. Remember that nuclear waste has been dumped on the east coast of Africa, as has been documented by the UN, and that multinational tobacco in flight from this market is trying to wedge open new markets on the continent. So what HIV makes visible is only a part of a much longer, much deeper, much broader problem. And so any response to it is going to have to be broad based. We can't cure our way out of cancer, even though you have to try. We also need to prevent it upstream. You are powerful people in this room. This is Harvard. So when you're out there doing your work, speak the truth about these problems. Amplify the concerns of your African partners. And lastly, care. Care at the political level means universal access like we see in Botswana. It makes no sense to build oncology that people have to pay for out of pocket. It makes no sense to build oncology as a freestanding vertical program. It won't work. It has to be integrated within a broader healthcare system. <clears throat> care at the social, and this is why Rwanda and Botswana are the perfect places for you to get going, because they already recognize this. They already provide that uh, social infrastructure um, for care from the primary level scaled up. So see what's possible there, and then you can't just pick up oncology and move it across the border to Zimbabwe or to Namibia. You're going to have to pick up the whole thing along with you. Care at the social level, at the level of personal intimacy, means paying attention to the experiences of patients and not only their disease. So it means supporting the incredibly difficult work of professional and lay nursing care in these settings. It means taking palliative care seriously. It means access to comfortable and functional prostheses for the many, many patients who will be amputated. I recognize that this is a tall order, and I recognize that we are only at the beginning. But I think it's best to be realistic and lay out as expansive a plan as possible, even as you begin to act. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Julie, for that wonderful talk. Um, so I'm Teodora Kolarova, and I'm a first-year medical student at Harvard. And my name is Ali Chisti. I'm a master's in public health student at the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, we help plan and coordinate the Go Talks with the help of many of the faces in the front row and throughout the room. Um, so for the next few minutes, we'd like to actually uh, open up the floor for a Q&A for Julie. Yeah. Right before. We the, the panel, which will be next. So, any questions you guys have for Julie? We, we have a couple of mics floating around there. So, if you just raise your hand, we can get a microphone to you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is this on the World Health Organization's agenda? For example, I know they're very concerned about smoking and getting control of tobacco and they're concerned with what we would call the burgeoning chronic diseases. Uh, does this fit into their scheme at all? Yes, it absolutely does. They're, I mean, they have a, 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 a I, want, I, I was going to say they have a program in place, but they're not really programmatic. They recognize it as an imperative, and it's part of their agenda. But I think we need to think about what actually the WHO consists of at this particular moment, what it is that they're able to produce. They've been emptied out somewhat systematically um, over uh, the course of several decades since the 1970s, and I'm not sure, it's, it's on their agenda, but what, the, what effects that's going to have, I'm not so sure. I'm sure perhaps you can uh, speak, somebody else can speak to that more strongly than I can. But yes, they're, they're quite aware of it, and it's part of that non-communicable diseases um, initiative that they're moving forward on. 
I mean, we could talk about hypertension and diabetes in Southern Africa, and we also would have a tremendous amount to talk about, that's for sure. Thank you, great talk. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the development of a cancer survivorship uh, research and practice agenda um, in the context of poverty? Um, when you have deficits in other areas along the cancer continuum of care, um, where does cancer survivorship fit in, let's say, in Botswana, in a middle income country? And what do you mean when you refer to cancer survivorship? Are you talking about psychosocial and emotional support? Are you talking about long-term um, follow-up and screening for sequelae? I'm just trying to understand what you mean under that umbrella of survivorship. Well, it's basically all those things. I mean, survivorship starts at diagnoses and carries on into um, treatment. and. Um, it's just patient support, advocacy, um, how to follow drug regimes. It's, it, it's a whole um, sort of uh, discipline or area within cancer care. And it's highly thought of here, and I just wonder what you think of it for like a middle income country. I think it's you know vitally necessary, and yet at the same time, Unfortunately, it's not yet part of the core package. And because you have a rapidly emerging epidemic and an ad hoc solution that's scaling up rapidly, that's one of the um, sort of secondary phenomena that's to be developed. The type of um, care that I see being provided by some of the most experienced and agentive nurses in PMH certainly rises to that level. But they really are working hard, those women, they're ma mainly women, and they're emptying the ocean with a spoon. And when they do that, they have to take away from other vital and necessary tasks um, that they're doing. There is an NGO, um, a local NGO, the Cancer Association of Botswana, that attempts to provide some kind of um, outreach or um, support group structure, et cetera. And that's probably a place where it would be wonderful for um, survivors within Southern Africa to start developing their own language and models for how to talk about this. Because some of this kind of cookie cutter move of, of what it means doesn't quite translate appropriately, which is difficult. But also, we're talking about a country that's the size of France. Most people are clustered along the um, eastern corridor, but nonetheless, there are really big distances. And so it's difficult um, for people who live outside of the major urban areas or very large villages. We call them villages, but they can have 100,000 people in them, so they're huge. Um, for people who live outside of those contexts to be able to travel, to access that kind of support, and to think about providing it in a decentralized way is very, very challenging. Um, so. It, it, I think it's an issue that absolutely needs to be on the table, but how it gets slotted into the array of things that people need, I'm not, um, I'm not sure. Part of that will depend on who pays for it. You know, if it's run by NGOs, then maybe it's a, it's a place that there can be some integration. If it uh, has to be run by the Ministry of Health, they really have their hands full. So, you know. Um, just really quickly before the next question, um, I noticed that some people are sitting in the back. You are uh, standing in the back. Um, if some of you could make space for them, because I see some free seats, so they could sit down. Thank you. Um, <coughs> next question. Go ahead. You mentioned. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. Very engaging. You mentioned the concern about screening without treatment. In HIV, wide scale HIV testing, I think, was really important to build local awareness, local advocacy with the treatment action campaign in South Africa, Tasso in Uganda. And it was really, is cancer different in terms of using screening programs to increase awareness, increase advocacy, which then motivates multinational pro local and the multinational programs to provide treatment? You know, I, I recognize what you're saying about screening for HIV before treatment was available, but I think it also had some very negative effects for many people. It produced a tremendous cynicism among many. It caused some people to distance themselves from others. It caused some people to distrust the medical establishment. Um, so it, it produced some positive effects and also some long-term uh, negative effects that I think we're still grappling with both sides of it. But nonetheless, um, I take your point. I do think that cancer is different 
in the sense that when we're talking about solid tumors, they will become recognizable as cancers eventually. There's no escaping the visceral quality of what they are, unlike HIV, which kind of disappears into a constellation of various symptomatologies. So it could be perceived as tuberculosis, or it could be perceived as the flu over and over again, or a rash, or the, you know diarrhea, or this or that. Uh, when somebody has something that looks like a pineapple growing out of their neck, that's it is what it is. So. Um, I don't think that we need uh, quite, we don't need screening in order to generate awareness in quite the same sort of way as we need screening conjoined to treatment. That, that's the argument I would make. Perhaps somebody would make um, a different argument I could be persuaded, but that's my sense of things. Julie, one of the things that the reason we're having this program is to figure out what we could do. So what is the footprint for American academic medical centers in the cancer area in Botswana. Is there any impact? You've, are we present there? Are we, are we contributing in any measurable way? I mean, we're starting here to try to engage this, but uh, we've, if my understanding is that there's been a tremendous impact in the AIDS area, but cancer, no. So what are your feelings about this? Not having been to Southern Africa since 2010 and recognizing that this is, again, a rapidly moving target, what I have to say may be out of date. But as of the last time that I was in Southern Africa, no, that's not a place where there has been a big impact by American oncology yet. It really is um, a constellation of African and uh, some um, European uh, expatriates or Chinese oncologists who are bought, brought on bilateral partnerships, etc., who seem to be running the show with the occasional American kind of cycling through. But that said, I do feel that there's a receptivity and an openness on the continent to it from what I can see. And there are older, longer standing partnerships in Uganda in particular. The Ugandan Cancer Institute throughout the 60s and you know, heading into Amin and Nabote when it all fell apart, had these really avid partnerships. And many of those partnerships are being reconstituted and rebuilt at the Ugandan Cancer Institute. I think there are some of those partnerships that are going on at the Ocean Road Cancer Institute um, in uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania as well. In a place like Botswana where you don't have an oncol you don't have a cancer hospital, you have a little cancer ward with a little clinic that services it, you have a, a very different um, kind of situation where I don't think it's going to be the first place you're going to feel those sorts of partnerships, except for the fact that here you are, and now I understand you have a tumor board that uh, you know, you can help with pathology when pathology is not possible there, et cetera, and those things are meaningful. Um, what kind of impact can be made? I think the first thing to do is to go and ask the people there who are working in oncology, what kind of impact? Can, what do you need? What do you want? And I think one of the biggest things you can offer is knowledge that works in the context. I don't want Botswana to have second class oncology. No, that's not what I'm advocating. But meanwhile, their uh, constellation of circumstances on the ground requires that diagonal thinking, which is very, very difficult. And it has to be done rapidly, 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 because there's this massive queue of patients. The oncologist that I worked with um, for several years, and I see what you see here also knows him, uh, uh, Dr. Pileski was quite brilliant at this. And he worked for 14 years in Zimbabwe. Then he worked in Botswana for nine years. Now he's gone back to Zimbabwe and is in semi-retirement. But what he knows, he knows because he worked as a cytologist and as a hematologist oncologist and in consultation with the radiation service. So I think we need to find those people and figure out what they know and what they think should be uh, the list of priorities. Waiting, you know, four months for a biopsy at minor theater suggests a whole uh, constellation of things that are necessary. So too does the absence of cytology when he goes back to Botswana. You, you need a dedicated 
cytologist. These are things you uh, guys have the ability to share, to produce. So too does your ability to bundle with you when you go the Kytro or whatever the brand name is here so people don't have to puke their guts out. There's nothing cultural about not going back for your next round of chemo. People say, oh, they're, maybe those Africans are too superstitious to follow through. No, it's hell. It was hell here. It's not the same. It's still hell here, but it's not the same kind of hell. And if we want people to believe that we care about them, and that's why we're bringing this, and we're not just using them as a bunch of guinea pigs, we have to bring the good stuff at the same time that we bring the horrible stuff. They call it the red devil, too. You know what I mean? That's something that we share. So I would suggest that we need a multi-pronged thing that scales up simultaneously. Laboratory capacity has to be part of it. So too does this uh, sharing of human resources, but so too does the palliative care piece. I know that, you know, I don't have a simple answer, and I, I can imagine that that may frustrate all of you tremendously. Um, but I would say each piece of it that you pick up Okay, you can only do one piece at a time. Remember all the other pieces as you do your piece. And never ever think to yourself that the people there are too stupid, too inefficient, too lazy, too something. And that's why they don't have the other pieces. That's just not true. You know, everywhere you work, there's some duds. We know them, right? <laughs> there's nothing cultural about that. They're those people. But that's the low hanging fruit. Just make your way past them and find the energetic people, right? Well, we're not ready to okay. keep talking about these themes in the panel session of our talk, which will be followed by closing remarks by Dr. Jay Loeffler. So if the panelists could come to the front, um, Dr. Stathew, Dr. Chulume, and Dr. Dryden-Peterson. I, I also have the opportunity of introducing our panel moderator, Dr. Dan Longo. So Dr. Longo is a, a deputy editor of the New England Journal of Medicine and editor-in-chief of my favorite textbook, The Principles of uh, Medicine, the Harrison's Principle of Medicine. He's, a, he's also a professor at Harvard Medical School and a physician at the Brigham. He trained in internal medicine at the Brigham, followed by hematology and oncology at the National Cancer Institute. He's published over 850 articles, uh, reviews, and and book chapters, and he's actually in the top 1% of cited authors in all of life sciences. So we're delighted to have you <laughs> and your expertise moderating this panel. So I'd like to turn over the stage to, to you guys. Thank you. I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we have a very distinguished and um, knowledgeable panel, uh, and we're eager to probe uh, some answers to some fairly big questions uh, by, by tapping into their experience and knowledge. Uh, Dr. Jason F. Stathew is an assistant professor of radiation oncology at Harvard Medical School and at MGH with a clinical focus in uh, generative urinary malignancies. Uh, working with the International Medical Corps, he helped uh, develop um, a training curriculum to assist the rebuilding of Iraqi oncology services as a consequence after uh, the war there. Uh, more recently, in collaboration with the Botswana uh, Harvard Partnership, he's led an MGH oncology team in an outreach effort to foster partnership and training to the oncology community in Botswana with a particular focus on care of HIV-associated cancers, and he was uh, part of the group that uh, introduced cervical brachytherapy uh, to the country. Um, he's, uh, he serves as the, on the Global Oncology Steering Committee of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Welcome. <laughs> Scott Dryden Peterson is an HIV clinician researcher at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and a research affiliate with the Harvard Botswana AIDS Institute and the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, he lived in Botswana from with his family between 2008 and 2010 and spends, continues to spend three months a year there. Uh, he uh, conducts research on the delivery of care to HIV-infected pregnant women and the care of their uninfected babies um, and is, uh, is uh, actively um, looking at uh, uh, the incidence and outcome of cancer in Botswana as a whole, which is vital information for 
uh, for planning where the impact of their of interventions that might happen as a consequence of uh, the efforts being planned here. Scott. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Motusi Chalumi was born and raised in, in Gaborone, Botswana, um, graduated from Luther College in Iowa, and, uh, and completed medical training at St. George's University uh, in Grenada. Uh, after completing medical training, he went back to Botswana and worked as a medical officer in, I, I think, in uh, PMH, if I'm not incorrect. Um, and, uh, we did that for three years and then came back to the United States to train in family medicine at Lancaster General Hospital in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, he obtained special training in HIV medicine and is certified by the American Academy of HIV Medicine and currently works at the Whittier Street uh, Health Center as a family physician and focusing his attention on the growing HIV population in that clinic. Uh, Dr. Chalumi. And finally, Julie Livingston, Dr. Livingston. Uh, I won't say I presume, <laughs> uh, but I did, didn't I? That's a, para that's a paralepsis, and I won't mention that. Anyway, uh, she's done an outstanding job of setting the stage for uh, the, the subsequent discussion. Um, and uh, the team has put together a series of questions that we'd like to try to address in the next uh, 45 minutes. And the first one is a big one. What kind of cancer care is needed in Botswana? In the United States, certainly, we've evolved to a point over the last 60 years of multidisciplinary teams. Uh, there's a focus on prevention. We've had a war on tobacco. Uh, there are interventions to reduce the risk of people who have genetically predetermined high risk for uh, certain cancers. Um, this, these interdisciplinary teams plan an approach for a patient often based upon molecular characterization of an individual patient's tumor. Uh, all of these are very expensive technologies uh, designed to optimize care. Nevertheless, the fundamental paradigm of cancer <clears throat> treatment remains taking the patient to the edge of what they will tolerate uh, in order, to, physically and mentally, in order to try to eradicate the cancer. The, this is not straightforward, uh, and it's not something that is uh, already a part of Botswana culture. And so the question is, what, are, what do, does the system need to look like? It, what parts of the American system are translatable and are not? And what can we do about making a start? What barriers need to be overcome? So that's sort of a lot of questions at once, and I apologize for that. But um, what should, are we trying to create a Western medicine system there? That's, I think, the big question. You're looking at me. Well, I <laughs> Is this microphone working? Yeah, okay, good. Well, um, this is a complicated question, uh, a series of questions that, that I surely don't have answers to, but maybe some, some observations. Um, <clears throat> cancer care is very complicated. It's integrated. It, re it relies on the piece of information you were just given to develop the next uh, decision making, it requires a lot of resources, it requires a lot of stakeholder engagement from everyone uh, that includes uh, the government um, and, uh, and, and care providers and patients, et cetera. So th this is a huge issue. I can comment maybe on a few things. Um, diagnosis of cancer is clearly where it starts, assuming you have treatment, as Julie's pointed out, to follow. Uh, and that can be very complicated in, in Botswana. There can be significant delays to diagnosis of a cancer. Some of those are that the individual patient ignores symptoms. Some of those are that care providers in the communities don't recognize cancer symptoms. Um, some of those come from the delays uh, uh, from biopsy to the receipt of pathology. Uh, there's a lot of different steps. Some of those uh, re come from a, a reliance on, on even traditional healers and, and the potential delays to diagnosis and, and definitive therapy that might be available. So starting to address all of those issues is critical. Um, that's just one comment. Another would be that this, this need for interdisciplinary efforts and integration in care. 
I, I can give a, a couple of examples. Um, one is, and, and this is an extreme example, and this is an example that we'd find in the US, so by no means is it unique to Botswana. But it was highlighted to, to our team when we were there uh, uh, over a year ago for our first visit. Uh, it, it dealt with a, a lady, a breast cancer patient, who received a diagnosis of breast cancer based on a breast mass. Um, it led to a mastectomy. Mm -hmm. It led to adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant radiation, radiation therapy, all the things that we would do here. All the pieces of care were there. It also led to horrific lymphedema of the upper extremity. And to this uh, mother of three, it, it led to the, the, uh, her husband leaving her because of this potential disfigurement. And now you have a single mother dealing with all of these <coughs> issues. And then it came to the question of tamoxifen, the ERPR status of, of the tumor that many in the audience know about. There wasn't the capacity to do immunohistochemistry, nor is there really yet the capacity to do immunohistochemistry in Botswana. So this, these, the slides were sent to South Africa for that. And the di all the slides were sent, and, and, and back came um, the, the, uh, uh, the report, which said that the patient never had cancer. Mm. And so this is an extreme example, and I don't mean it to, to, to be, uh, 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 it's not commonplace. Uh, and this is from years ago, it was told to us from one of the clinical oncologists uh, that was there it was a patient of his. And of course, he had to have that conversation with the patient. It just tells you how complex cancer care delivery really is and how you need to build all the pieces of the puzzle and how you need to encourage communication amongst care providers. Um, I think Scott and I can talk. Uh, Scott and I, by the way, we're, we're medical students. Uh, he does ID, I do oncology, and we, we, we joined up on this. And I think we, we can talk maybe later about efforts, uh, a, a tumor board that, that's ongoing now that has allowed for the oncology community, the ID community, the house officers, the um, all care providers to come together in one room at least once a month and discuss a patient case together. And the enhancement in communication, the addressing of potential systems issues in the delivery of care, that at least it starts to point out the questions are raised. And what, once you go through you know, uh, a, a, a half dozen of these tumor boards, you realize some questions are, are commonplace, they're consistently. There's the consistently the same issue or the same barrier. So I think starting to address that. Yeah, I mean, I think that getting back to the original question that I think that the system sh should and, and almost does to some degree emulate the system that's here in the United States in terms of cancer care. And I don't want to get don't want to, us, for the people in the audience, understand a very pessimistic view of oncology in this environment. There's obviously a tremendous amount of challenges, but there's, there's also a lot of good care that's happening despite challenges. And, um, and, and that, so I think that there, there's one of the reasons that, that Dr. Limison mentioned that Botswana and Rwanda and other places are good places to start to work is because a lot of the things are actually there. A lot of these multidisciplinary parts are there. There are individuals who are trained to give radiation therapy. There are, there's one chemotherapy nurse in the, gov in the government sector. There's, um, there are increasing numbers of oncologists in Botswana and things have developed even since, since you left. And Yang Granzachan is now available for everybody who gets chemotherapy and steroids are given and, and other antibiotics are given. And so there's certainly improvements that have occurred over time and there, there continue will be it, those improvements. Um, but it, but it is incremental. And because the, the full multidisciplinary aspect is not there, that some of the care is different than we would do here. That, for example, for breast cancer, the surgeons are generally in their fifth, sixth, seventh decade, and they've been practicing for a long time. And they don't routinely do lymph node dissection. And so a woman with a breast cancer will usually get a mastectomy despite regardless of the size of the tumor, and she'll invariably need to get radiation therapy because they don't know whether her axilla was involved or not. And so that leads to additional morbidity for that particular woman, but it's a way to work around the roadblock that there isn't the current skill in the country to do lip, um, send a lip no biopsies and dissection properly. Um, and so I think that they don't think that the eventual oncology system will be different than what we have here. Um, Where are the resources going to come from? Uh, the, you know, in, in AIDS, there's been this success, 
related in part to uh, the assembly of support from the Gates Foundation and from pharmaceutical companies and from private uh, sources of income uh, to tr help underwrite the costs. Is there anything like that on the horizon for cancer? I mean, the, the government of Botswana pays for, I think, 90% of HIV care currently in the country. And it is true that the Gates Foundation, in, in conjunction with, with Merck and a bunch of US-based organizations, encouraged the, the initiation of the program. That this, this was done by the Botswana government and Botswana people. And they can do a lot in cancer care, too. And for the most part, cancer care is not, doesn't have to be tremendously expensive. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the, the drugs are relatively cheap and they work quite well. Obviously, the incremental benefits of, of what we are experimenting with here in this country of personalized medicine for your tumor, your genetic makeup, that that is still a ways off. But providing standard care to highly curable cancers is possible without a lot of money. I think you could also think about. Oh, sorry. Think about moving along two tracks simultaneously. On the one hand, you want to develop the gold standard, and on the other hand, you want to maintain this totally beautiful thing that Botswana have built and can take credit for, which is the greatest good for the greatest number. And you can see some of that happening, like algorithmic treatment for KS that's disseminated across a vast um, primary health care landscape so that at the primary hospitals now, they can do, they can treat the vast burden of KS that comes in, which is the most commonly diagnosed cancer. And that can be provided by people who are not oncologists, but who have been trained to do it. And that pulls some excess out of the system that then doesn't aggregate in the oncology ward, while at the same time making sure that the woman who comes in with breast cancer, her care is being um, improved in the ways that you both have described. So it can be two things to the middle, and then maybe we can learn something from that to make our cancer care here a little more affordable. There, there, there is work being done on sort of guideline-oriented care for, um, for a setting such as Botswana. And I think surely that's something that uh, that we can we can take part in and, and assist with. The other, the other one big thing that I just want to highlight that that was notable to our team, at least in our visits to Botswana, is challenges in follow up of care. Um, it, it, so we've talked about the issues surrounding diagnosis and having all the pieces of the puzzle for good treatment. And there is the critical component of follow up of care for a few reasons. One, did the treatment you gave work? <laughs> And, you know, simple question number two, uh, and linking that into registries and the, the, the need for, for uh, epidemiological efforts, and, and Scott has started or works very heavily on, on, a, on a registry in, in Botswana, cancer-based registry. But the, the, not only the outcome of therapy, but did, what harms did your therapies do? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a radiation oncologist, and we saw many patients, the team, our team that went there, that would come in, they would be displaced from home, Thank goodness for places like the Cancer Association for Botswana that provided interim housing for those weeks of therapy in the capital of Havarodi. But then they would go back and maybe hundreds and hundreds of miles back home, never to be seen again. What did that radiation do? Did it cause horrible effects? Did it cure the cancer? We don't have those answers, and that needs to be instituted somewhere, and that's complicated. Do you think that that, that, that follow-up needs to be uh, professionally trained MDs, or can community health workers be trained to collect the information? I, I, I think you nailed it. I mean, there are many models of good care delivery, right? Uh, Algorithm-based care, uh, other specialized, trained uh, oncology care providers that surely don't have to be MDs, and probably are better not to be, mm -hmm. unless these are serious complications or issues that need to be addressed uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that way. But, but that's a big one. Um, and and I, I don't know, maybe Scott can comment on, on the issue of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Botswana-Harvard Partnership has been in Botswana for over 15 years. It's been a big part of the, the anti-retroviral program there. How, how, is, how is that follow-up care delivered for patients on, on long-term HIV meds? Uh, Whether it's task-shifted to me? So in Botswana, no, it's generally it's provided by physicians. Um, initiation and retroviral therapy, and then usually the follow-up visits is by physician. In part, due to a strong lobby of nurses that you know, have a relatively narrow definition of what they, their, their job description is, but maybe you can speak to that more. Yeah. That daily. yeah, I think uh, to, to really understand 
how to move forward. We have to understand the setting and the limitations of the setting. And we, you know, we have a lot of limitations. And we were talking a little bit about uh, you know doctors. You know, who's going to do the follow up? Do we even have enough doctors to do the appropriate follow up? That's that's the first question. Um, and then, do we have systems in place? You know, do we have somewhere that if you know, they find that there is an issue, do they know that there is an oncology ward at Princess Marina that, you know, they could even just pick up the phone and talk to someone. So uh, there's, there's a lot of infrastructure issues that would really, really have to be addressed in, in order to understand the way forward. Um, and, you know, multidisciplinary is good, but when each of those disciplines in of itself is not working well, how are they going to work well together? So to build up that care, you really have to start from really, really the bottom. So is the AIDS effort tightly networked with local <coughs> physicians? Uh, is its success related to a group that's communicating regularly with one another, or is it more recipe driven? There, there, there is, there, there was of course a big push to make sure that, you know, people were getting tested, people knew how to start basic uh, ARVs, uh, and that people knew that if, if patients were failing treatment, they could refer somewhere for somebody who maybe has more advanced knowledge to, to help and then refer them back uh, to continue uh, the new medications that they might have uh, started. Um, but the government had to really get a lot of uh, input from, from international donors and a lot of teaching. There's, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the GITSO program, which, which it's for all, all, all providers and it teaches them just basic HIV care and it's done at different places around the country at different times of the year and they really wanted to make sure that every provider in the country had that very basic HIV knowledge, how to, how, to, how to diagnose, how to treat, how to follow, and all those things. And if we were to disseminate and try and get more cancer care uh, around the country, you would really have to do a lot of education. Mm -hmm. that, that's just no way of getting around that. Um, and so it, it leads to the next point. We need to get buy-in from the government. And to get buy-in from the government, the government has to recognize, and you have to convince them that this is an issue that needs special attention. So it goes back to the epidemiology. Um, so it's it's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting back to Dr. Chabner's question at the very beginning, um, related to what, what can a U.S. academic institution do in this regard, that Kito was one example of something. This was something that was done through Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health through the Bokwana Harvard AIDS Institute who created this, this module that lasted you know, several different sessions that all physicians and then, then nurses and laboratory technicians were trained in how to administer antiretroviral therapy. And this occurred over a period of years and then it's ongoing and now that KITSO program has been transitioned back to the government and the government runs it um, to continue to, for new clinicians who come into the country or be trained within the country to all know how to treat the common optimistic infections and how to prescribe antiretroviral therapy and the important considerations in that regard. And so I think that we, as, as not living in what's one all the time, still have the, have the ability to, to help with those sorts of things. Are there common cancers that are susceptible to the same kind of model? Uh, well, as Dr. Livingston alluded to, that the, the, the most common cancers in Botswana um, or cervical cancer, capsid sarcoma, breast cancer, um, and to, to a certain degree, the, what's that? Non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma. Non yeah, I, I left it out because it's a little bit more complicated. Right, exactly, but, that's the one that has to but, <laughs> but, um, but, but those ones perhaps are uh, can be done in that same sort of model. Um, and and not Hodgkin's lymphoma. I mean, it's complicated, but in Botswana, it's all treated the same way. They all get chopped, and so. That too has the ability to be taught to, to a greater pool of people than currently know how to do that. Uh, what about the current global efforts in Botswana? What, what needs to be amplified? What's working? What's not working? By global efforts, you mean sort of collaborations with others? Yes. Uh, you, uh, uh, Dr. Livingston mentioned 
a Pennsylvania collaboration, and there's the Harvard connection, and there's this effort of the Global Oncology Program. So yeah. there's a Baylor one. I mean, you know, Baylor Yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of players. Yeah, yeah but and, and I think that it's right. There aren't that many that are doing oncology care at this moment, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, the, um, the Baylor program, which was set up to provide an, um, HIV care to children in, um, in Botswana, um, has been phenomenally successful with that in Botswana and in many other African countries, um, hosts a, a permanent um, Baylor-employed um, oncologist who treats all the pediatric cancers for the country and also consults with other, different re other countries in the region as well. Um, and I think that's a, a, a relatively successful model, although there haven't been local pediatric oncologists trained in combination with that program, and so the sustainability is always a question. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, our nascent sort of collaboration, I think, is also helping to some degree, but we don't know whether that's going to be sustainable. We, we, so, I mean, on, on that point, we, we uh, the folks who have been there the longest and have had successive models are, are the, the HIV, the ID folks. Um, you know, the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute uh, has been there for over 15 years. Penn has had a presence there for a shorter period of time. Penn has been very involved in uh, some screening programs and, and screen and treat sort of uh, um, uh, programs that, that clearly have been successful models. Um, our effort is a, is, a, is a young one. I mean, it's been, it's been just since January of 2012, so a little over a year. Um, I think the important focus there, I mean, your question is what's successful in global oncology? Um, I think we have. I think we have Tim Russell back there. Tim, do you mind just raising your hand? So, just want to credit uh, him for to date having made t two visits, a third visit coming up, for really helping introduce specialized treatment care that can fit fit kind of algorithm-based care. In this case, cervical brachytherapy, which we know is a curative treatment for these uh, uh, women with cervical cancer. Um, it needs really quite uh, 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 expertise level of care. And now what Tim has done in just two visits to date is not, he's not one of the one performing them all, he's performed you know, many, but he's built the capacity there to do it. And, and very much now, I think uh, Tim would agree that the, 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 the oncology folks there are doing this independently and then are doing it independently quite well. Mm -hmm. So here you have a new cur curative therapy introduced into the country just over the last year that is clearly going to show benefit over time. What's your next step? Well, th th you know, that's a great question because, I, you know, our model of engagement has been one of capacity building and expertise issues. And so our, our immediate next step is another trip coming up in May where we uh, have so far been kind of radiation focused, but now very much extending into medical oncology. Bruce is, will be joining along with Jeremy Abramson who's here and, and they'll, they'll be addressing the lymphoma uh, uh, specialty <coughs> expert issues. Uh, we have uh, Lydia Shapira, we have a, a, a breast surgeon, uh, and Michelle Gad, who will be coming to uh, help uh, address some of the breast issues. So we're doing it kind of disease site based. Uh, and, and Paul Bussey, actually, here, who's in radiation, who will be coming to, to address head and neck issues. Head and neck cancers are a significant problem there, and they are incredibly complex to treat. And radiation is a curative treatment, and radiation has to be done well in that setting. And so he's going to try and do that. Now, that, that's really, again, capacity building using all the very strong local talent that's there and just, just kind of expanding the level of expertise. But our, I think our real successful model of engagement, and one that one could suggest academic centers could use as a potential model, is, is what Scott and I and a large team have worked on, which is a, a monthly tumor board, right? So this is done by teleconference. It's uh, done with uh, internet-based, kind of WebEx-based uh, 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 participation. It has had anywhere from 20 to 50 participants on the Botswana side, and that, is, that, that extends not just MDs and oncologists, that's the ID specialists, that's the house officers, they're the th radiation therapists, uh, et cetera, are in that room to get pathologists, uh, uh, radiologists, they're in that room together. And that is one of the very few times that, that they're in the room together. And they can meet each other and talk about things and see what, what, what systems issues can be addressed while being linked, in this case, to MGH Harvard-based sort of disease site experts that deliver peer review and, and commentary on, on ongoing challenging cases. So this, is a, this has been going on for over a year now. It's happening monthly. We, we feel that it is a successful model. And I think that's a nice way that we can remain engaged in a longitudinal fashion and potentially a very sustainable fashion. 
uh, without having to, you know, sort of be on, on, the, on the ground 100% um, uh, of the time. Now, now, just one last thing to say on all of this is this is not just Harvard or MGH saying this is the way to do it, right? I mean, uh, if you come to these tumor boards, you very much learn that this is a collaborative partnership that takes into account resource potential limitations that are there. Um, uh, but it's a two-way street. We have a lot here to learn about cancer care that is done well in Botswana. And this goes back to, to, to Scott's point. There is a lot of excellent care delivery there. And there's expertise that is there that we do not have. If you want to learn about advanced cancer in young patients, in HIV AIDS uh, uh, patients, um, if you want to learn about Kaposi's sarcoma, you don't come here, you go, you, you go there. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn about how you deliver complex cancer care delivery in the setting of, of immunosuppression, something that nobody has a good handle on, you go there and you learn and you hear about, well, what kind of chemo can be tolerated in this setting, what kind of chemo radiation, what have you. So, you know, I think this is the sort of, at least in my opinion, the collaborative partnership that can be built and one hopefully that can be built on remote-based uh, ongoing participation. And just one footnote to that, I think that the, the teaching related to brachytherapy, I think you, you mentioned, um, Tim Russell mentioned that, the, that now that unit, with the one brachytherapy unit, treat, has a higher volume of treating patients with cervical cancer than probably any unit in the United States, save maybe MD Anderson. And so that, even it was just two weeks worth of training, I think, I hope, will have a sustainable impact, at least on those women that are trained there. And then other things will hopefully be tackled in a similar sort of way. Maybe not quite as immediate sort of impact, but, but hopefully have something like that. Sustainability is always a worry of planners, but it sounds as though there's no precedent for, for your efforts not being sustained. It seems, seems like everything you've tried has worked in the area that you've tried it in, and and as you expand, it also seems to be gathering momentum. Is that, am I painting too rosy a picture? Or well, I, 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 you, you don't want to call success too early. Mm -hmm. and, and surely other folks have tried tumor boards in the past, and they have failed. Um, ours is definitely the longest running, and, and by participation and, and, and interest, primarily on our, with our Botswana partners, it's growing. And, and interest of folks in the room. Many here have participated on this side and, and, and take that hour you know, to come in and, and, and offer their expertise. So I, th I think that is a model that is sustainable. We don't want to call success uh, um, uh, too early. But one really important point, the only way that this is uh, ultimately successful is broad stakeholder buy-in, right? So it, it's, it's, we have here a representative from the, the Botswana Embassy Master Bipedi who, you know, the Botswana government, the Ministry of Health and the hubs in, in uh, health, innovation, and education have been 100% supportive and in endorsing of this. The U.S. Embassy has been as well. Um, you know, the, we, we, it's this sort of broader, we, we, you know, the, we're, we're sort of working with the, 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 the University of Botswana that, in fact, has a medical school. Okay, this is a model for, 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 for Africa. I mean, in very much, many ways, Botswana can become a hub of good health care delivery and education. Um, but it's still in relative early days. It's, there's still work to be done. But it's this sort of broad buy-in by the community, the education, the health, the government, the et cetera, that ultimately would make any of these efforts sustainable. Um, if I can add to that, I think that one potential danger I see, I'm not saying it would happen, but is that the, your partners on the other side are people who are in the trenches. And they work really hard day in, day out, emptying the ocean with a spoon in an institution that, like all big institutions, has its dysfunctions, where machines break, where things go in and out of stock, where they have a very high volume of patients to deal with. So they don't have the luxury of interacting with the patients in the way that they would like, which is uh, degrading to them, where they run a lot of night call, where medical officers are uh, not wealthy people, nurses are not uh, wealthy people, they have relatives who are also patients in the same hospital, they feel a lot of pressure in their um, social network to care for those patients as well as um, the patients that they're taking care of. This is to just say you're talking about people who have lived through concurrent epidemics that are very pressing, they're working very hard, um, and sometimes I think for them to feel like there's another thing that they're now expected to do for the same money, 
more time is being asked of them while they're on the tumor board with you, the line of patients is not shrinking. The number of drugs they need to track down is not suddenly appearing. So somewhere within that process of I recognize that you are offering them something that they need and want, we also need to acknowledge that it's giving them yet another task. And these are people who have a lot of tasks. And it's, that's their challenge. Their challenge is to remain committed in something that over time it's easy to uh, become a bureaucrat. Uh, you know, no offense to bureaucrats, but you know, to, <laughs> to become a little uh, disengaged around in order to survive in that. Um, so somewhere within there, I think we need to think about the conditions under which the partners on the other side are working, not the specialists, but the people below them who are the vast majority of labor. Um, and for them, they face these glass ceilings. It's difficult for them. They can remain a medical officer or a resident for the rest of their life. They can remain a staff nurse, not able to jump to the next level. So they, they, you all can move your career forward and can in your head sometimes rely on that at the end of a long day. Well, I did something for my career today, even though something bad happened to the patient or whatever. They don't get that necessarily. So I think we need to uh, think about that a little bit. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that, having worked in that system. It's, it's very difficult sometimes to step back and see the bigger picture of things because you're just so busy trying to stay afloat. Um, uh, things don't work the way they should, you know, ordering simple lab tests sometimes you don't get the results back and it's very difficult to provide the care that you want to provide for your patients and still stay sane at the same time. Uh, just because the system uh, still <coughs> has a lot of work to, to make it work cohesively. So I, I, I totally agree with that and I've, I've experienced it. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to just on a daily basis feel like you're making a difference in your patient's lives. And, and then I think that that leads to the other principal threat in my mind to sustainability is frequent rotation of staff. That um, frequently, you know, I, I worked in the HIV treatment clinic and you would, you would train a nurse to do a very good job of administering drugs and then she would all of a sudden become the matron and have a bureaucratic job instead of a, a patient job. Or um, just a few months ago, all three medical officers on the oncology board were en masse transferred outside of the oncology board. These people had been there for three years. They were practicing as oncologists would in this country, and all of a sudden they were all gone. And so all the capacity that was built with them also goes. And, 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 and that people also leave because of burnout. And Botswana currently still has to rely on predominantly expatriate physicians. Um, it hasn't yet graduated its own medical school class um, will in a couple of years and hopefully this, this will change over time but if people are, are coming there to, to work for a while they can also leave and, and, they, and they do and so then they got capacity that you built all, all the oncologists that we work with are originally from Zimbabwe and I think if Zimbabwe improved they would probably go back too and so so ha so that is also a threat to sustainability over the long term so it sounds as though uh, assessing the impact of a program like this is going to be very complex. In the first place, you don't have all the epidemiology you need to know whether or not you're impacting survival. It sounds as though a component of the program is going to have to be recruitment of, of staff and their training and assessing periodically their level of happiness and satisfaction and doing what you can to improve that. So what, what do you see as the problems of, of assessing the, the success of, a, of whatever program you create here? I, I think that the program that we create is a, it's a rather small thing in the, in the whole scheme of things. So hopefully it's a catalyst to other things that will be developed by the government, by the people, that will be much larger than anything that we're able to accomplish. Um, and we are there mostly listening and trying to provide the assistance that is asked of us by the Ministry of Health and other people. Um, Botswana does have good systems in place to monitor the usual things we want to monitor, which is the incidence of cancer. There is a national cancer registry. The, the Ministry of Health of Botswana is probably the size of the white building here. It's a, it's a big place. Um, one little office in that is dedicated to cancer. Mm. Um, and they maintain a cancer uh, registry that is 
the only nationally representative cancer registry on the continent, um, and it's quite complete. Um, and so we'll, we will be able to track cancer incidents going forward. Who and made the decision to transfer the oncologists away? And, and is there any way to influence those decisions? Yeah, there is. We, we screened. <sighs> yeah. We screened. A lot, we got a lot of other people to scream, and they came back. Oh, <laughs> that's a good. You didn't tell us that part. <laughs> but it is also part of the way the health system there runs, that people work on a rotation of approximately two years in a position, and then they're rotated to another position. And one of the reasons that the... Uh, various domains of the civil service, including medical care, operate that way in Botswana is it helps prevent corruption. So, I, I mean, I'm not suggesting, so send the oncologist away. I don't mean that, but I mean to say, uh, whenever there's a decision in Botswana that you think to yourself, why do that? That doesn't make any sense. It also, it's worth stopping for a minute and saying, why do you do that? You don't do that just because you feel like doing do -si do with the people. Why on earth was the HIV nurse now a scrub nurse? That doesn't make any sense. And on the one hand, it doesn't make any sense. And maybe the case needs to be made to the Ministry of Health that that, that the time for this is, is over within the health system, but the concerns that they have, that people don't sell drugs out of the back door. Yeah, it's or, just going on until 7, and then I'm going to shut it down, and then you're going to... I think we're under threat. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me... Uh, I think that this has been very interesting and stimulating. I, I'm not trying to close this down. I, I'm leading to the next question. Okay. The next question is that I think this has been so interesting and stimulating that a lot of people in the audience who haven't thought about it before might be interested in participating. What does somebody sitting in the audience who wants to make a difference do to try to help participate in this program and make a difference? So that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I think, uh, you know, we have Ami and Franklin here oops, sorry, uh, who have sort of spearheaded getting the the, um, the, the the sort of the Harvard community together uh, with who have interests in global oncology, uh, and, and they should be um, uh, acknowledged for that. And, and what you see here is also a number of students at Harvard Medical School who have actually opened their own wing of the global oncology interest group, getting involved. And, and I think more and more this interest is growing. So we have to think about how we're going to sustain that and how do we engage this level of interest. And, and um, you know, if there are folks who are interested, there are easy ways. Come to our tumor board. Come to other, you know, go-related activities. Those sorts of things, and see what what actually captures your interest. We have to think about: uh, is there a way we can develop a training program in oncology that supports careers interested in delivery of global oncology? The ID folks have this. Uh, we don't really. And so I know, you know, Bruce. Larry Shulman and others are working, you know, hard kind of at the leadership level to see if this can happen within uh, uh, hematology, oncology, and, and, uh, and, and et cetera. Uh, we have here uh, uh, folks like Jay, Jay, who, you know, none of what the work we've done anyway in Botswana would, wouldn't be true if it weren't for his support, specific support in this. So again, at the leadership level, there is um, su support of junior folks who have an interest in this being able to do that. And I think we need to just kind of um, acknowledge that and, and, and nurture that mm -hmm. uh, and then find places. Not everybody can go and live in, in, a, in an African country for a year <laughs> or, or even, even less than that. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways that you can have an impact. So, uh, you know, I guess we would encourage you to, to come to the events that are being organized, kind of the talks like this, and, and, then, and then start talking to the folks who are actually doing it and, and, and get involved. The major um, successful efforts at um, reducing risk factors in the United States have mainly been policy things, you know, making it hard for tobacco companies to sell their, pro their products. We're, we're down to something like 13 or 14 percent as a smoking rate. But I saw a statistic that said something like 80 percent of the world's smokers live in middle and low income countries. I don't see how we're going to make an impact on that without government support from you. I, I think this is such a huge issue, and it, it comes back to how do you retain the good folks, yeah. right? And, and, you know, a lot of, like, you know, like, like Scott said, the, the, two, the two clinical oncologists we've worked with most, um, they're clinical oncologists who trained in the UK model, of both chemo and radiation, but they're from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there hasn't been a, uh, a graduate yet of the, the, the medical school, and there are the, the retainment issues. The government, in, you know, in our opinion, has to incentivize a, training, you know, developing the educational uh, framework, 
but then the retainment of those who are trained, whether trained in the country or out of the country coming back, um, and, and, and rewarding them for the, the excellent care that they deliver and for pushing the boundaries forward. And, and you know, what are those incentives? I don't know. Uh, and, but it is an important issue. As Scott, you, you mentioned, uh, there was kicking and screaming going on when the, these three phenomenal house officers who delivered over 90% of the oncology care at Princess Marina Hospital <coughs> threatened to leave. They were leaving. And there was a lot of kicking and screaming and, 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 and uh, outreach efforts by Scott and others to, uh, to the government uh, saying, you've got to retain these good people. And, and ultimately that worked. But in, ultimately the government needs to figure out how to retain these people um, and, and, and build that local capacity and, 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 and grow it. And I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I, you know. Um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, government has to definitely realize that this is an issue that deserves their attention because um, one thing about the government, uh, they might be making decisions maybe because they make economic sense and they're looking at the bigger picture. And if, if they're not aware that you know these, some of these decisions that they're making have these negative effects on the population, then you know they're going to do what makes economic sense and not necessarily think about these other things. So um, again, it really goes back to getting government buy-in uh, and, and really making sure that they realize that you know it's this this is a, a problem that deserves utmost attention. Just like with the cervical cancer, you know the fact that. A lot of good stuff is happening with cervical cancer is because it was made a government priority and now it's happening. Same thing with HIV, it was made a, a, a government priority and you know these amazing things happen. So if, if we can't do that, then I think in the setting of Botswana, you, you won't get very far. In, in the governments need to understand this is money well spent and there is money there. Um, the, the uh, you know, and there's much, very much an acknowledgement that 75% of cancer deaths are gonna happen in these countries. Cancer is growing. I mean, in the U.S., it's relatively stable, relatively. Um, but it's it's in these in these countries where the cancer incidence is growing and the deaths are happening. And that, uh, you know, just like the HIV crisis in Botswana threatened the whole population. I mean, the 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 average a, uh, life expectancy went from mid 60s to mid 30s during that. Um, and and you know, is there the potential that cancer could have the same impact on an entire population? I mean, these are numbers that would scare any government into supporting, uh, you know, s prevention, right, which is what you're getting at with the right. smoking, uh, you know, the screening and, and then the treatment. In some ways that there's, there's more low-hanging fruit in terms of prevention um, than Botswana because smoking is increasing, unfortunately, and that is a big challenge and will have to be dealt with. And the cancers that arise from that will be a few decades off. But, um, H HPV related cancers account for 30, 40 percent of all the cancers in Botswana. Um, so vaccination, while perhaps not perfect for the serotypes that are, that are currently present, um, would have a big impact. Earlier treatments for HIV would have a big impact. A lot of things could have a big impact. The two thirds of, of, of cancers in Botswana arise in HIV infected individuals. So figuring how to prevent cancers in those individuals would move along. I think I also heard your question was what, what can people in the room do in yeah. terms, terms of, of, of um, trying to help uh, in this regard. And I think that there's roles for all sorts of different people to, to help in this process. Um, the, since Dr. Pileski left and went back to Zimbabwe, the cancer ward is, has not run the same. Um, so there's urgent need for someone, an oncologist, who, who go live there permanently and, and, and provide care. Um, the, the system. It's quite complicated of how you obtain therapy with a lot of with a lot of evidence. It's a place for how the distance people travel and then to get chemotherapy and then to get the radiation therapy and to get the proper paperwork in order to qualify for radiation therapy. And there's a lot of need for for shepherding or, and guidance through that process. I mean, even people who don't have medical training can help with that and partnering with the Cancer Association of Botswana and other agencies that are doing those sorts of things. There's lots of things that people can do concretely regardless of level of training or expertise. Do we have time to take a question or two from the audience? A question or two. A question or two. Anybody in the audience have a question? Go ahead. So I would say, yeah, so my wife's in Rwanda working there, trying to figure out very much the same kinds of things you've been talking about. And one of the things that became fairly obvious to me quickly, because there, they're in the gastric cancer belt, 
and so that in fact esophagogastric cancer is um, at least as far as the uh, Rwandan tumor registry could determine the most common cancer followed by a breast cancer. And so a good way of delivering sort of continuous infusion 5-FU is important to them. And there's a very simple solution, which is oral capecitabine, you know, it's a, or S1 if you wanted to get it from Japan, but it's so extraordinarily expensive. And so one of the things that just like happened with the AIDS epidemic is engaging the pharmaceutical industry to try to really figure out how to do this right, because the solution is there, it's simple, but we can't do it because it's so costly. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. Right. Very important point. point. There, there is a, uh, an organization called the CEO Round, Roundtable on Cancer, which I belong to. I'm not a CEO, but they've asked me to help. And, and at the last meeting, I brought up this issue, and surprisingly, got a very positive response. Like, we didn't know you needed it. Their impression is that the cheap drugs are coming from India and there's no need for other drugs from, from Europe and the United States. I think they'd be very interested for the good public relations that's involved. And there's some people actually that, are, that care about this and, and see the, the ethical side of this uh, issue. So I, I think that we can engage them and we can get it. What we need are trained personnel over in, uh, in uh, Botswana to, uh, to administer the drugs and develop a reasonable reg regimens. One last question from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, my name is John Coppich. I'm a third year medical student at the University of Minnesota. And I wanted to thank you all for uh, doing this work. I think it's fascinating. Uh, one thing I'm interested in is going back to Minnesota and seeing if I can try to get a group out there involved in assisting with this work. So I'm, I'm not in the Harvard community, obviously, but uh, if Dr. Bat or Dr. Huang have any recommendations for how we could do that, um, there's a lot of eager students out there that would be willing to help. All right, I want to thank the panel for stimulating discussion. Uh, very informative for all of us. And Dr. Leffler is uh, going to conclude the, the evening for us. Thank you. Um, it's been an incredibly successful uh, conference this afternoon, and I want to thank those uh, on the panel and our speakers who have come so far away uh, from the embassy in Washington uh, to be represented here is quite significant. <clears throat> also want to thank the Harvard Center uh, for AIDS Research for co-sponsoring this uh, event as well as all those in the audience who I can point to who had so much to do with this successful day. This session made me reflect back 10 years ago when the senior leadership of this hospital was sequestered at Harvard Business School for three days and two nights. A beautiful time of the year was in the spring and the professors at the business school said, the first thing you have to do before you have a strategic plan is write a credo for the hospital. So we sat for an entire morning and we listed the four most important things for this institution moving forward. One is to provide safe, appropriate, effective care for all of our patients, quite obvious. Two is to continue to educate uh, medical leaders for the next generation and continue with cutting edge research. But what we added that day, which is now part of the mission statement of the institution, was service to our community. Well, our community at that time was Chelsea, Revere, Boston, <laughs> but then the Reagan Institute happened, and all of a sudden it was commitment to wipe out AIDS and tuberculosis in Southern Africa, and David and his team are doing that, and we'll do that. And then it was Mr. Lunder who gave us a beautiful gift for the Lunder Building who said, that's not enough, we need help in mid-Maine, northern Maine. So now that's our community. And then it was to help the Japanese, the people of Indonesia from the tsunami events. And so this institution in particular, our community has changed and dramatically in 10 years. I think what you heard today represents that so well. And thank you all. The reception, as you know, uh, is following in the uh, Paul Russell uh, Museum. Thanks and have a good night.